Good evening and welcome to the Eagleton Institute of Politics for this evening's presentation by Kimberly Keeler Allen. The title of her talk is Black Women Lead Congress, The Difference They Make and the Road They Took to Get There. My name is John Weingart. I'm Associate Director of the Eagleton Institute of Politics and I'm delighted to welcome you here, those who are here for the first time and others who've been here often before. I want to thank you for choosing to spend your Thursday evening with us. For those of you who don't yet have plans for next Thursday, <laughs> I hope you'll be able to return to this room to hear from the two authors of a brand new book about Newark, former Newark Mayor Ken Gibson. When Gibson was elected in 1970, he became New Jersey's first African American mayor. His victory was major national news, and he went on to serve four full terms. As Representative Bonnie Watson Coleman writes in the foreword to the book, Gibson's election helped usher in active participation in elective politics by the nation's racial and ethnic minorities. But inspiring as his electoral victory was, Gibson's departure from office 16 years later was even more so. He left after having served with competence and integrity. So that's next week right here at 545. There's no charge for this event, but we do ask that you pre-register from the Eagleton website if you do plan to attend. And I think there are flyers about that out in the lobby. Tonight's program is this year's Albert W. Lewitt Endowed Lecture, a, former that, uh, a forum that was established at the Eagleton Institute by Alfred Lewitt's sister in memory of her brother who had worked on Capitol Hill in the late 1940s on the staff of two U.S. Senators. This 2019-2020 Lewitt Lecture is especially dedicated to Albert Lewitt's niece, Nancy Herman, who passed away earlier this year. Nancy was a longtime friend of Eagleton and is remembered and missed by many of us at the Institute. Kimberly Peeler Allen has been working at the intersection of race, gender, and politics for almost 20 years. She is widely recognized as a highly skilled political organizer and fundraiser and is the co-founder of Higher Heights, a national organization building the political power and leadership of black women from the voting booth to elected office. Kimberly and her co-founder, Glinda Carr, have built Higher Heights for an idea into a network of over 90,000 members, donors, and activists across the country. They have elected, helped elect black women to Congress, the United States Senate, and a growing number of state and municipal executive offices. In 2013, Kimberly served as finance director for Letitia James's successful bid to become public advocate of the city of New York. And during the past, this past year, she was the co-director of James's transition committee after she was elected attorney general for the state of New York in November 2018. Also in 2018, Kimberly was awarded a fellowship from the Roddenberry Foundation an honor given to a small number of, quote, activists, community leaders, and organizers leading efforts for a more just and equitable society. Finally, this year, to our great delight, Kimberly agreed to serve as a uh, visiting practitioner with the Eagleton Institute's Center for American Women and Politics. She's making herself available to speak with classes and other groups of students, faculty, and staff while pursuing one of her major projects, which is writing her first book to be called Activist Mama. It's my great pleasure to welcome this year's Albert W. Lewitt Lecturer, Kimberly Peeler Allen. It's always awkward to, um, to hear someone read your bio because you're <laughs> thinking to yourself, who are they talking about? <laughs> um, it is a, a pleasure to be with all of you this evening on this rainy November day. Um, I am so grateful to the staff and the team here at Eagleton, particularly my colleagues at COP, uh, who we have partnered with um, uh, almost since the inception of Higher Heights back in 2011. When we started the organization, we said we need to have some sort of baseline of what have black women done in American politics. And through doing you know, just some quick Google searches, we realized that there was no data out there. But we saw a lot of data about women of color. So, and as we were looking at that data, we realized, wait, it's all being housed at one place. And that was here at Rutgers. 
So we put in a call to Debbie Walsh, and she said, come down and, and, and let's sit and talk about it. And she brought in her team, and they said, you know what, we actually have all of this data. We just need to pull out the cross tabs. And we would be thrilled to be a partner in telling the story of the role that black women have played, not just as elected officials and candidates, but also as voters and leaders of national movements. So it has been a wonderful partnership, and it has um, taken on a whole nother level now that I'm here at the center. And um, I'm just so like really overwhelmed uh, to, to be here and to have this, have this moment. So to talk about black women leading Congress, uh, there's, there's so many places to start, but I'll, I'll start with, um, you know, you heard a little bit about my bio, but you know, what brought me to this work and why, um, why, I'm, why I'm interested and why am I trying to tell this story? So when I was in my early 20s, I knew that I wanted to work in politics. I didn't know what that really meant. I just knew that it was something that I wanted to do. And I also knew that, according to my parents, that was not a real job. <laughs> it was not a career. You could not pay your rent. It was just you know, something that someone else did. But because I was blessed to have some amazing history teachers uh, through junior high and high school, I said, you know, I had this, this, this interest. And also, because of, of how they presented the material and how it tied into current events, I understood very clearly what government can do, how it can change lives for the better and for the worse, and also what, it can, what the possibility is if we all truly participate in our democracy. So you know, once you participate and you vote, and then to be able to hold your elected officials accountable, not just when you're not happy with them, but cheering them on when they are taking those hard lines, and what that does for really engaging and making our democracy truly the vibrant thing that it was meant to be when it was drummed up by our founding fathers, uh, I knew that I had this was my life's work. So when I tripped into my first job in politics, because that was not what I was supposed to do, remember my parents said, go get a real job, um, I was absolutely elated. So after working in a lobbying firm in Washington, fresh out of college, and then moving to New York, becoming a political operative and fundraiser, I was able to really take the time to look deeper at this system that I loved so much. And through my work as a political fundraiser, I saw up close how candidates, donors, operatives, and voters were cultivated, nurtured, and activated. And I saw a stark difference in how these groups were approached. And in the, ini the initial fault line that I saw was around race. And then the more I was focused on that, that, that schism, I saw that the deeper fault line was also gender. And I worked on campaigns where black women candidates who were extremely well credentialed and had the tr a tremendous amount of experience were discounted simply because they did not fit the status quo of a white man who was their predecessor. Of course, it was, it was never said in those blunt words. It was always, well, you know, it's, it's a tough race, or I just don't know, you know, I don't, I don't know if we're ready for that. <laughs> and I saw, you know, the way that black women donors were compartmentalized and put into the black event with black hosts, black uh, invitation list, um, and were left off the list of for the major galas and the, the major fundraisers and coffee clutches with the donor class in New York. Even though these same women could have written the checks and raised the money just like anyone else. And I saw black women volunteers who, and voters who were you know, the, the backbones of the party, that they were just basically ignored until mid-August for a September primary, or mid-October for a November general election. And I heard countless stories of people coming into the office or coming in after, after the polls closed and said, if I only had so much, you know, more time, 
I could have done that other side of my street. I could have reached out to you know, the, that other segment of voters, but they just didn't give me enough time. So after running my political consultancy in New York for over 10 years and working on campaigns at every level of government and hearing from women organizers and organizations that they were not going to support one of my candidates because though she had over 60% name recognition, because we, we had done the poll, and had been in elected office for four years, and had a track record of public service as long as your arm, she hadn't raised as much money as the white man in the race, so they didn't think that she was viable. I went from being perplexed to being furious. And that candidate went on to finish first in a close primary that triggered a runoff. And then she went on to win that runoff with 60% of the vote, and all being outspent five to one. That candidate served five years as the public advocate of the city of New York and went on to run and win a decisive victory last year, making her the first black woman elected statewide in New York and the 65th Attorney General of the state. So how did Tish James do it? She organized, she drew on the sweat equity that she had put into the city that she loved, and she drew on the power of community. For me, Tish's 2013 race for public advocate was an exclamation point on what I had known for years, that the viability and electability of black women looks different. Successful black women candidates win on the strength of their volunteer base, on the strength of their personal connections with voters, their ingenuity and their resilience. Black women, because of circumstances for some and instincts for others, can, as they say, make a way out of no way. A lot of, a, a lot of it has to do with the lack of generational wealth in the black community in this country. The fact that this generation of elected leaders may be two or three generations away from ancestors who were sharecroppers in this country, or four and five generations away from ancestors who were considered chattel and three-fifths of a person. The skills that were critical for survival for those generations have been passed down and give black women the resourcefulness that is necessary when seeking a seat at a table that was not just not built for them, it was built to exclude them. And as I mentioned, the, the 2013 race really exemplified what I had experienced for years. I knew from my own personal network that there were hundreds, if not thousands, of black women who were looking for a political home. Whether they were voters, activists, operatives, candidates, or elected officials, no organization existed that would support these women and elevate their stories and issues that they cared about in an authentic way. And that was how Higher Heights was born. There we go. Higher Heights is the only national organization exclusively dedicated to harnessing, organizing, and mobilizing black women's political power by making sure they have the tools to effectively engage, advocate, and lead. We are the largest online political organization aimed at electing black women in this country. Over the last eight years, we have built a network of activists, donors, and allies who have supported our work to make sure that black women lead at all levels. We have el helped elect women to Congress and to serve as may of mayors of the top cities in this country. We have helped Black women see the power that they have to be the deciding factors, not just in elections like the Alabama uh, special election, the Senate special election in December of 2017, or the, but also in the 2013, 2017, and this past Tuesday's election in Virginia and New Jersey and Kentucky. And we are the deciding factor in those close elections. Black ma women make a difference, and we will continue to do so, whether we are acknowledged or not, because we know the stakes are too high for us not to engage in the political process. At the end of 20, the 2016 election cycle, when many of us were still processing what had happened, 
black women actually had a lot to celebrate. 96% of black women voted to keep our nation moving forward. And more importantly, black women candidates ran and won up and down the ballot. We had elected the first black woman in over 20 years to serve in the US Senate grew the number of black women serving in Congress to historic levels, and we saw an increase in the number of black women in the state legislatures all across the country. It was in that space that I began to see a paradigm shift. As with many organizations, we experienced an uptick in the number of women who were interested in running for office. But it was not at the level of our white counterparts. Higher Heights spent much of the beginning of 2017 reminding people of the impact that black women had had. But and in the 2016 cycle, we had endorsed five candidates. We were anticipating for 2018, maybe 10. But as we moved into the fall of 2017, our candidate tracker grew from 15 to 25 to 40 by December. And these were all absolutely incredible candidates. They were community organizers, they were philanthropists, a dentist, a pastor, commissioners from the statewide office, city council members. But for the sake of full disclosure, they, the majority of them were Democrats. There were a handful of Republicans that bubbled up, um, but you know there were maybe 10, but the, the numbers were hugely on the Democratic side. And the thing is about these women, they weren't taking on the safe democratic seats. They weren't taking on open seats. They weren't taking on districts that were you know, historically democratic. They were looking at seats that were held by Republicans, that Donald Trump won in 2016, and they were not backing down. Lauren Underwood was one of those candidates. We had first heard about Lauren uh, from a friend of a friend uh, right around Labor Day of 2017. She sounded great. She was a registered nurse. She'd worked in the Obama administration. She'd worked on the ACA. And to top it off, she was born and raised in her district outside of Chicago, and her parents still lived there. I must admit, though, I was a little skeptical because of the stigma that some candidates have when they move home to run. How much do you re how how connected are you really to this district? You're just parachuting back in. But then there was the other question of she was so young. She was 31 at the time. And she was running in a district that was less than 3% black. And she was a woman. And and, and. I remember I had a conversation with um, a counterpart at a majority women's organization, and they were focused on the, the and, and, and of, of her candidacy. And I had shared a lot of those same concerns. But as an organization that was dedicated to electing black women, the only way you're going to elect black women is if you invest in black women. So that's what we did. So we sat down and called her, and she came in from Chicago to our office in New York in late October of 2017. And we sat and we talked for three hours about why she wanted to run what she wanted to accomplish, what she saw the weaknesses in the Democratic field thus far, what she saw the, the weaknesses were in the incumbent, what she saw as, as her own weaknesses. But then she shared her plan of how she was going to outwork everyone else in the field. She had done her research and known that the incumbent had never traveled the entire district. He had never had or he hadn't had a public event in almost three years. So she said, my plan is to show people what representation can feel like through my campaign. And she had mapped out how she was going to hit every single county, every single major neighborhood, and listen to people. She said, They'd, I, I don't have to say anything. I just want them to know that someone is listening. And it was as she was saying this that Glenda and I looked at each other and we leaned in. Like, 
she's going to put in the work. And that's when we decided that we were going to endorse her. So she was our first endorsement in the 2018 cycle. We endorsed her on Shirley Chisholm's birthday, November 30th. And, uh, and I must pause and acknowledge the fact that 51 years ago, this past Tuesday, Shirley Chisholm was first <coughs> elected to Congress. Without Shirley, there would be no Barack, there would be no Hillary, there would be no Kamala, there would be no Corey, there no Elizabeth. It would not have happened. So we must pause and, and give credit where credit is due. So we endorsed Lauren, and we were her first national endorsement. And as she was campaigning, and she was making the rounds around the district, some of the other partner organizations, women's organizations, were making endorsements around her within the state of Illinois. And she called me and she said, I have a problem. I need you to make some calls because people are starting to look at me and ask me what's wrong. Because they're dropping in and they're doing all of the districts that are around me, but they won't endorse me. I've raised the money. I don't, I don't understand. So I put up, I was like, well, yeah, that's, that's why we're here, to be that advocate. And I put in some phone calls. And the folks were still focused on the and, and, and. It's like, she's doing the work. They're like, well, she's not getting any co uh, coverage. She's outside of Chicago. Nobody's getting any coverage. Come on. Well, you know, we just don't know if she can do it. She is making the round. She's putting in the effort. If you are all about supporting women, she is the only woman in this race running against five men. Why are you not endorsing? They never really had an answer. So she continued to campaign. And when it became apparent, about six days before the primary, that she was actually going to win because she had picked up all the <laughs> Chicago newspapers and somebody actually dropped in and did a poll and had showed her leading. That was when the other organizations came on board. And you ask her about that now and she'll smile and she said, I I'm grateful for all of the support that I had. <laughs> but we know that what that really means. So she went on to win that election, and with 60% of the vote in a six-way race, a black girl, black millennial woman, won in this white district. And one of the things that just bothered me so much is that the gatekeepers just did not acknowledge the power of black women and also the fact that all issues are black women's issues, full stop, because we are small business owners, we are veterans, we are healthcare providers, we are daughters, we are sisters, we are friends, we are wives. Every aspect of the American life affects us. So we can speak to that along with the, through the lens of race and gender, which means that our story is your story. There is something in our everyday experience that can connect you to almost everyone. And they did not want to acknowledge that. Or maybe they didn't see it. I'm not quite clear. I see it. And then looking at the opportunity of Lauren's race, people are like, well, you know, the district, I, you know, there's only, it's only 3% black. You know, the white people aren't going to vote for her. It's like, did you really say that out loud? <laughs> but we look at people like Bonnie Watson Coleman here in New Jersey. 70, the district is 70% white. You look at Val Demings in Florida. The district is 75% white. Lisa Blunt Rochester in Delaware, she's got the whole state. <laughs> it can be done because all issues are black women's issues. So Lauren won her race. 
and people started calling. And the day after the election, the DCCC, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, came in and said, you are one of our races. We're, we're going to put you on the red to blue list. The Illinois primary was early February. There were only three or maybe four states that had already had their primaries at that point. But that list of people who were on the red to blue list was probably 35, 40 deep. And a lot of those people actually had contested primaries. But the party infrastructure had decided that they were going to put their finger on the scale for those candidates. But they wouldn't do it for Lauren. I'll let you figure out what the difference is. So she had the, finally had the support that she needed and began to campaign. And she went on to win. And we're proud to have her today. Lauren persisted. Jahana persisted. Ayana persisted. Lucy persisted. And Ilhan persisted. None of them had the institutional support that their white counterparts had. None of them had the field cleared like some of their white counterparts. But yet they won. I had a partner organization tell me, uh, as I was talking to them about one of our, our candidates that was not successful, that uh, you know, early in the process, oh, we actually decided who we were backing in that race um, back in the, you know, late 2016. The field wasn't even set yet. Did you go out and see who could possibly be a candidate? Or you just took the, the low-hanging fruit? Majority organizations and institutions and gatekeepers are not doing the work to cultivate, target, support, and uplift black women candidates. So we got to do it on our own. But we can do it. It's easier when you have the wind at your back, but it, it's not always necessary. You know, one of the things that, um, you know, talking about how the gatekeepers and the, um, and the policy players and, and all and the party players uh, put their fingers on the scale. Um, you know, an extreme example of that was Johanna Hayes' race in Connecticut Five. You know, there was a sudden vacancy in that seat, and Johanna had a decision to make. And literally with 13 days before the, um, the convention, that's how they decide who gets the, the nomination, she decided she was going to throw her hat in the ring. So, you know, Johanna was a teacher. She'd grown up in the district, lived in the district. Um, to say that she came from humble beginnings would be very generous. But she was a teacher, and not just any teacher. She was Teacher of the Year in 2016, and knew the district, knew the families, knew the community, and knew the needs better than anybody, because she was a teacher. So she decided that she was going to throw her hat in the ring, and she had 13 days to pull it together. So she immediately called on her students. And they started, they came, and they volunteered, and she was calling delegates and pulling it all together. She gets to the convention. Speeches are made. Votes are cast. Around the auditorium, they have these screens. Tally comes up. She's won by two points. There's a gasp, then a cheer, and then the lights go out. <laughs> when the lights come back on and the screens are rebooted, she's down by three. There was a lawsuit that was immediately filed, discovered that some party bosses had changed people's votes because of, of a verbal uh, affidavit. But they couldn't find the paper ballots because they were in somebody's car and the car was broken into. <laughs> I'm not making this up. And they had not, uh, you know, followed the the the, um, the custody command that was laid out in the party's bylaws. So she said, "You know what? 
I'm gonna run all the same. And she ran and she won. But they were they were fighting her tooth and nail. But you know, it just shows the, the perseverance that black women have to make their community, their country a better place. I mean, it, you know, I've, I've talked about it, but I'd rather you hear it um, directly from, from her. Day after the primary, all these endorsements popping up. All these people endorsing me. I'm the front runner. I'm the candidate. So I'm working on it because I know I still have a little bit of petty in me. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, Johanna talks about, you know, the, all, the, the, all the, the hoops. And all we want is a fair shot. All we want is a fair shot. Start from a level playing field, not having to have to overcome a thumb on the scale. But to have the same ballot access, the same opportunity. Oh, whoops. <laughs> There we go. Um, have the same opportunity to present their case in their own words to voters. That's all we want. If the over 90 black women who put their name on the ballot in 2018 you know, had started with an even playing field, can you imagine what this country would look like? Maybe we would, instead of just electing five, maybe it would have been 10, maybe it would have been 12. But, you know, it, it would just be mind boggling. We would actually be at the proportional you know, levels. Black women are 7% of the US population. If we have 30 black women in Congress, we are at that rate. We're getting there. We're at 25. We're getting there. But we should think beyond the fact that these would just be black women because of, there we go. Um, you know, these five, we didn't just elect five black women to Congress. We elected a nurse, a teacher, a state legislator, a refugee, a domestic violence survivor, a breast cancer survivor, someone who has experienced homelessness, someone with a pre-existing health condition, and a mother of a slain black boy. These women are going to sit in their committees 
and in meetings and in hearings and town halls and bring the totality of their experience with them. If these black women are bringing these you know, nine, 10 identities that I just rattled off with them, growing the number of black women in Congress can only expand the types of voices that now have a presence. And when we are, have more diverse voices around decision-making decision tables, better decisions are made and fewer people are left behind. So what have these women done in the 10 months that, since they were sworn into office? Quite a bit. You know, the media has put a lot of focus on the members of the squad. And there's just four of them out of the you know, 40 some odd freshman women um, and five black women. And Ayanna Presley and Ilhan Omar are members of, of the squad. But in addition to, to that moniker, and attract the ire of the commander in chief on a regular basis. These black women, uh, members of the freshman class, have introduced legislation to provide student loan relief, provide universal free meals to our public school children, removing the stigma for children of need, increasing funding to school ba based health centers to support preventative and mental health services for children and adolescents, and increased funding to the CDC's rape prevention and education program. They've had legislation, they've passed legislation protecting veterans from economic hardship, and that piece of legislation has actually been signed into law. And that's just the beginning. It's only been 10 months, and they're freshmen. You know, they, got, they got a lot of people they gotta fight through. But their presence, in the hearings has been absolutely epic. So God, God this, is, this is the, um, the education committee. So actually, um, Ilhan sits a little further over. So there's four of them in one hearing. And um, I couldn't get the, the, the edit right, but uh, the four of them just eviscerated uh, Betsy DeVos. <laughs> and if you ever have, uh, you know, probably a good 35, 40 minutes of time, it is worth going to C-SPAN and watching. Um, just uh, particularly Jahana as, as an educator, uh, just, you know, just being so pointed and so dogged about the, um, the lack of answers uh, f to the questions that they that were being asked, and it, they just kind of they they all just tag team off of each other. It's a beautiful thing to watch. Oh, it's not playing. We're not to you yet. Yeah. Well, this is, uh, I don't, it was working earlier. Uh, <laughs> but this was a hearing where um, uh, Lauren Underwood is questioning uh, Secretary Nielsen about the, the physical effects uh, on the children who have been separated from their families. And, uh, you know, in, you know, medical terms that the secretary should be familiar with because she is, you know, le she was leading the effort at the time. Um, and Lauren just goes through very, um, very deliberately and uh, very calmly goes through step by step. Do you understand that when these children are separated, it affects their cognitive development? Do you understand that? This, by having them separated, they, it is not something that they can recover from. Just by reuniting them, it does not erase the damage that has already been done, and, and on and on and on. But the first answer that um, Secretary Nielsen responds is, I'm not familiar with that term. And it, so Lauren just goes, goes forward and says, this is what it means when you have a medical professional 
questioning a secretary about the medical effects of policy. And I wouldn't have that knowledge. The majority, she, Lauren starts her remarks saying there are uh, lots of lawyers sitting around. I am not a lawyer, I am a nurse. So this is how I'm going, this is what I'm going to talk to you about. And this is what happens when we have more diverse voices around decision making tables. We bring that experience and are able to truly hold our elected officials, our administrators, our, uh, our leadership accountable because we have the knowledge base. The knowledge is in the room and that makes better decisions overall. So in addition to what these women have done legislatively, they have shown the possibilities that exist in black women's leadership, what leadership looks like, and how you can campaign and lead as your authentic self, you know, bringing all of the messy with you, because we are all messy. And to pretend like it doesn't exist is, does no one any justice. I had lunch with Lucy McBath over the summer, and we had a very frank conversation about the help that she was going to need to continue to be able to do the work. The day that she was sworn into office in January, three Republicans filed paperwork to run against her in 2020. She said to me, Lauren and I, and some of the others have talked about this we all, all the time. The system was caught off guard having all of us come in at once. We're upsetting the apple cart. We don't know how long we'll be able to stay here but while we are, we're going to make the most of every moment and speak for those who have never had their voices heard. What we're seeing in 2020, at least on the candidate side, is that the dam has broken. In 2018, we had over 90 women file paperwork to run for, for Congress in total. Thus far, we've already seen that many file their paperwork with many states months away from their filing deadlines. What remains to be seen is what the institutions, party bosses, and gatekeepers will do. Will they recognize the viability and the strength of black women who have stepped off the sidelines to run? Honestly, I'm not optimistic. Everyone knows the words that they need to say to make it seem like they are really doing this, but putting actions behind those words is another story. And we know that for every two steps forward, there is a step back and that the backlash is coming. I do believe that the electorate is paying attention more than ever before and scrutinizing the candidates that they are hearing about and also looking for the ones that are flying under the radar. One of the reasons that Higher Heights was founded was to help amplify the stories and the work of women because we know that overall, women do not get the same press and airtime as their male counterparts. And if you're a woman of color, you might as well fade into the woodwork. But we know that we have to fight back. We have to fight back. I do have faith. Uh, well, I don't have faith in the, uh, in the structures and the systems that have discouraged and oftentimes downright blocked black women from seeking the representation that they deserve. But I do have tremendous faith in the perseverance of the women who have stepped off the sidelines to run. I have faith in the American people, and I have faith in our democracy. Jahana, Lucy, Ilhan, Ayana, and Lauren are all walking in the unbought and unbossed spirit of Shirley Chisholm. They each lift as they climb and are making the most of the opportunity to listen to their constituents and bring their voices into rooms that they never had been before. We're not a fad. We are here to stay. And we're here to stay not because we're trendy, but because we're damn good. <laughs> <laughs> so with every class of congressional members, the bar is raised. And I know that the, that the candidates now are looking at these women as examples of how it can be done, just as Jahana, Lucy, Ilhan, Ayana, and Lauren looked at Barbara Lee, Maxine Waters, Barbara Jordan, and Shirley Chisholm to guide their steps. 
Their impact will be long lasting. Where's my mouse? There we go. And little black girls. No. There we go. We'll look back at them and see themselves. Thank you. So I'm open to questions. All right, so we're gonna go into the Q&A section now. I wanna say thank you for everyone for coming. Um, if you could please state your name, where you're coming from, and then give a quick question so we can get as many questions as we possibly can tonight. Um, Kimberly, would you like to go ahead and uh, select a questionnaire? Going once, going twice? Yes. I always seem to volunteer here. <laughs> My name's Jeff Davis. I live in Monmouth County. And I have a two-part question of, on some very tough issues that your, your uh, team would have come up against. How did gerrymandering, how was it overcome? Or did, did you not find that as an obstacle? Did you have your candidates running in gerrymandered districts? The second part of the question is a, is a tough issue because if you're running candidates in uh, red states, the issue of pro-choice versus pro-life is one that could be a very difficult one to walk through. Mm -hmm. um, two excellent questions. Gerrymandering is um, something that I think just about every district uh, has had to face in some way, shape, or form. We have um, had to deal with it more with our candidates that we have supported in the past who have uh, faced being drawn out of their district. Uh, and um, Alma Adams in North Carolina um, immediately comes to mind uh, where she had a um, she had a, a great win she had a solid support across her district and the North Carolina um, legislature not just carved up her district breaking up her support but it also actually drew her out of her district like they went around her house and, and drew her out of her district. So luckily those lines were thrown out, but um, you know, it is something that is, um, that you can't escape from and how the lines are drawn and uh, the electorate uh, as, as they find it, as these candidates find it. And what we generally tell them is, you know, run to serve the people that are there and do the best that you can. Know that the system is, is skewed and how we do this is by making sure that everybody participates in the census and then we have you know, nonpartisan uh, you know, uh, redistricting coming up in 2021. Uh, and uh, just you know, Taking it on, you know, as like this is a structural barrier. This is how lines are drawn to prevent women, particularly women and particularly women of color, from running and succeeding. But by you know running a strong campaign and speaking to <coughs> issues across the board, you can bring those people along and basically thumb your nose at the people who tried to to cut you down. Regarding the issue of choice. Um, I had a conversation with a candidate uh, who was running for state legislature in Mississippi um, about two years ago. And um, you know, she said, how do I talk about this? She said, I am unabashedly pro-choice. I am running in the Bible Belt. I, you know, it is, it is a, um, an issue, a bone of contention within my own family, let alone with uh, my constituents. How do I talk about this? Uh, without them just, you know, immediately responding back, you know, you're murdering babies and, you know, all of, all of the, the, the tropes that, um, that the other side uses. And I said the best way to combat that is to talk not about the procedure, but what the, what having a choice, and what, what having a choice means to a black woman. The economic impact of ha having control over how big her family is, when she has her family, and the economic mobility that that will provide. Uh, and the health, you know, the concerns about a woman's health and letting her make that determination of what is best for her body and for her family and that is a, a way to push back. And when you talk about it from a perspective of, well, I don't 
you know, if I find myself, you know, if a woman finds herself in a, a position where she is um, pregnant and doesn't think that she has the economic support, maybe it, she is in an abusive relationship, and talking about all of those other pieces uh, that are not easily explained away with, oh, well, just put it up for adoption. Well, we know that part of the, mortal the black maternal mortality rate is domestic violence. It is delivery and domestic violence. So by just bringing that baby to term, she may know that because of the relationship that she is in, it is a it, she is jeopardizing her life in more ways than one. So giving them, uh, the, and the woman said that that response was, was very helpful for her because some people had said, oh, well, just don't talk about choice. And she's like, I, I can't not talk about it because it's something that I believe in and I think it's something that every woman should have the right to, to have. Um, Every woman should have the, you know, the opportunity to decide what happens to her and her family. Uh, so she said that was, you know, those were talk points that she found extremely useful. And she actually uh, texted me months later and said that she had used some of those, and it it helped. It didn't necessarily sway voters, but it brought the the level of the conversation down to something where people could actually understand and, and hear the, the decision-making process. Question. Um, hi, um, my name is Pam Jasper, and I'm authoring a book about Obama and women called the Hi, my name is Pam Jasper and I'm authoring a book about Obama and women called The Obama Chicks. And I just wanted to respond to the last question. I guess I don't really have a question, um, but uh, I was at the Congressional Black Caucus and I met Ayanna Presley. She was part of a panel uh, targeted for black women called Black Girls Vote. And in that, she talked about gerrymandering and particularly prison gerrymandering, how prisons are often um, built in suburban areas, mm -hmm. and yet the prison inmates are often black men or men of color who do not permanently reside in those suburban areas, mm -hmm. so that when the census is taken, it recognizes those prisoners as part of the suburban district and thus politically those suburban areas gain more resources and power because of that and the urban areas lose resources and power simply because it as one of the additional knock-on effects of mass incarceration mm -hmm. and i remembered this because i just remembered this i remember <laughs> sitting in the audience looking at her and uh, her saying that, and I don't remember the solution other than her focus, her, she's saying that her fo one of her focuses will be the census. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that's a challenge. That's, that's a f form of gerrymandering. There are other forms. Hello, you're awesome. <laughs> so um, I guess my question as a kindred spirit, um, what role do you think black women can play, and I'm going to use the terminology, king making, um, because I know it has a negative connotation to it, right? But when you're in systems that are, you know, to use New Jersey as an example, where the bossism is entrenched in law, so the ways that you figure out how to maneuver around them is to understand the system. Mm -hmm. And I just would you know, be interested to hear your thoughts around, you know, you have those women who run, but then the role of being involved in the system to also impact it. Mm -hmm. I'm a, a big proponent of the inside outside. I'm sorry, game. Missy Baumier. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of the inside outside game. You have to have the, po the folks who are outside, who are pushing the, the grassroots, who are uh, you know, yelling at, at, 
you know, Trenton, why are, you know, what the hell are you doing? Um, while also having the people who are inside sitting at the table who are taking that, taking that energy and taking it and turning it into legislation that can then get passed so that it's a, 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 a reciprocity circle. And um, so I say that we got to organize. You got to organize. You have to uh, understand that. You know, look at you know, come up with the, the common goal and the common good. And you know, we may not you know see eye to eye on on this particular issue or that particular issue, or we may never have even crossed paths before. But together, if you're pushing from North Jersey and somebody else is pushing from South Jersey, and then you got some people in Trenton who are whispering to the legislators and you have the legislators themselves who are pushing, then there is a movement that can create the change. Hello, how are you? My name is Shonda Simpson. I'm from Newark, New Jersey. I am currently in a place that I don't quite understand. I am acknowledging that my past my education and my professional experience is taking me somewhere. I don't know how to get there, and I don't understand the entire process. Uh, currently, I work for Child Protective Services. Mm. Okay, I grew up in this system. In addition to me being a foster child, um, again, I'm a professional as well as a licensed caregiver. Okay, and so prior to doing, prior to being licensed to caring for a loved one, because mm -hmm. I'm into, okay, this, this curse, this, we done with this, okay? So I would hear some of the issues and concerns that some of uh, the families, uh, the complaints, basically, mm -hmm. that they would make. Mm -hmm. And I would hear it and I will always give them some feedback, you know, encourage them. But then, as a caregiver, I had some of those same experiences. I'm like, whoa, you know, this is what they're talking about, you mm -hmm. know? So now I feel like God has put me in a position to, I'm like their voice. Mm -hmm. I am their voice. And one of the things that I've never liked were people being, um, you know, the disadvantage being t abused, mm -hmm. you know, in any form of way. And my mouth has always gotten me into trouble, you know, because I fight for people who feel like they don't have a voice. So now, you know, I have brought some things to some people's attention, and it appears as if um, you need they're to run hearing. For office. Uh, excuse me? I said you need to run for office. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know, you know. So, <laughs> so, again, my mouth, you know, I'm like, well, you can't do that. That's not right. Mm -hmm. I have to add that the current leadership that I'm up underneath and the office that I'm assigned to is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are really passionate about uh, stabilizing the family unit and strengthening the family unit. That's what I'm about. But unfortunately, not everybody has that same mindset. So in me addressing issues, <laughs> a complaint has gone in, but when the complaint was received, the person that was contacting me and said, you know what, I did not perceive it the way that they presented it. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to encourage you keep doing what you're doing. Absolutely. And so I hear it, I know it needs to be done, and I'm committed to it, but I have to be, I'm scared. Mm -hmm. I'm scared. That's real. Because of the powers that be. You know, this can, this can flip mm -hmm. and turn ugly <laughs> at any moment. You know, so I'm like, God, I need help. I don't know what to do. I don't know who to pull, I just need, help because I honestly believe that my experience, my three-dimensional experience, um, continues to echo in my ear that I am an answer to a lot of people's prayers. Absolutely. And so. I would say that from what you've, what you've shared, that 
this is the beginning of organizing. This is between the, the, the clients that you come in contact with at work and uh, the experiences that you're having in your personal life and recognizing and most importantly speaking truth to power. Uh, that that is that is organizing and you know whether it is then joining up with other people who are beating that drum because you know one finger and I don't I can't push you down but a closed fist and you feel that so I would say just continue to to speak up yes it is scary yes it is risky but think about the risk and what would happen if you didn't and no one else has your experience, so no one else can speak to that. So continue to do it, band with others who are doing it as well, and together you will eventually shape, shift the system. Hi, my name is Sharon Price Cates. Wait, you go. Right. Hi, my name is Sharon Price Cates. One of the things that um, you stated is that you know, most of the people who are running uh, women are substantially underfunded. Um, but still, if you could just say a few words about the power of um, encouraging uh, women, African American women, nevertheless, to have more engagement in making political donations, no matter how small, because I think um, the Obama yep. uh, election really taught us the power of mm -hmm. many people giving small mm -hmm. gifts in yep. order to help candidates. Absolutely, absolutely. We we talk. Uh, I mean, my my background, um, as I shared, is is in fundraising and asking people for that dollar. And I remember I had a conversation with my mother um, during the the, tw the 2008 campaign. Uh, and I told her, I was like, well, have you written your check to Obama? And she said, I don't have that kind of money. And I said, but mom, your, mon your money's green. It is US currency. <laughs> Whatever you give will make a difference. And you know, we, you know, I totally get, and I mean, I know I don't have anything extra. I don't think anybody in this room would say, I have extra money to give. If you do, I need to talk to you afterwards. <laughs> um, but it's not about giving that extra, it is shifting. I'm not saying you need to you know, write that huge check, but you know, if you go to Starbucks twice a month, three times a week, whatever, shift your, shift your Starbucks money for one week and shift that to political stewardship. You know, we, we're, you know, particularly as black people, we are the most philanthropic out of any demographic in this country. We give more money annually to our religious institutions, our civic organizations, our sororities, Eastern Stars, all of that, than any other demographic group. But we do not give politically. So it's, it's shifting. We have, the, we have the tendency. We know what it is to give. This is part of that stewardship. So shift, you know, we also say, shift a pair of shoes whether you are wearing red bottoms or Payless, when Payless was still around, <laughs> shift a pair of shoes towards political stewardship, whether it's quarterly, monthly, annually, however you are comfortable doing it. But make that shift, because we don't have anything extra, but every dollar counts. And give, uh, you know, if you can't write $100, give $5 a, m a month. You know, just like you have your auto pay on, on your cell phone, your cable bill, your light bill, whatever, just set it up. You know, there's, there's all sorts of technology out there that can automatically debit, and after a while, you don't even miss it because it's just what you do. So it, I strongly encourage that you, whether you are, that you support, you do a couple of things. Everybody in this room should do a couple of things. Figure out what your budget is for, political sustainability and investment. Whatever that number is, it is a number that matters. Whether it is $250 a year or $2,500 a year, whatever that number is, it makes a difference. And then figure out who you wanna give it to. Look at candidates, look at women, look at people of color, look at organizations that are investing in voter engagement, not just here in New Jersey, but across the country. Because there 
is you know, so much work that needs to be done, both locally and nationally, and spread it around because it will have an impact. So do that. Think about you know, the last pair of shoes that you bought. How much did you pay for them? Could you shift that you know, in two months, three months, towards some political giving? Because it will make a difference. And until we are giving at the rates politically that we're giving to our, our churches and our, and our other philanthropic endeavors, we will not have the candidates who have the support. I mean, I talked about Tish James. We were outspent five to one. But I had some seniors who would come in every month after they got their check, and they would say, you know, I, you know here's, here's my, my $10 for the month. I'll see you next month. Get, give me some palm cards. I need some more posters. Let me know when the next phone bank is, and I'll be back. And that is what kept our campaign going. So absolutely, give and figure out, every, and ask other people to give as well. Ooh, all sorts of questions. All right, one, two, three. Hi, thank you Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I started following her, and it's like people will give to you, even if they don't have the same political affiliation, if you're affiliated with them otherwise. Mm -hmm. That's important to think about. Also, um, I went to Debbie's Ready to Run, I ran for board of ed, and then that's where everything started. Because I'm really a civil and fiscal libertarian. And women were the ones that tore my back out. First, there was It's possible. It is doable. <laughs> so there's two. of thought they bring, but also their willing, in my experience, their willingness to also hire a very diverse staff. Mm -hmm. And when we look around Congress, when we look around New Jersey's front office, when we look at all state legislators' front office, we see that there are very little women uh, staffers and political operatives and very much less uh, women of color. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I have a two-part question. So first, do your candidates ever feel pressure about uh, needing to hire, you know, predominantly men or predominantly, um, you know, white staffers. Do they feel that pressure? Um, and, and two, uh, you know, just speaking about the importance of also speaking about the importance of the staff that every of these uh, elected officials are bringing with them, because you're not just electing 
that official, you're electing right. their staff too. Well, on our, um, so for, to earn our endorsement, we have a candidate questionnaire. And one of the questions, actually it's, it's a multi-pronged question on our uh, questionnaire is uh, how many, what is the um, census on your campaign staff? How many women, how many people of color, how many women of color in spe specifically? Uh, because we, that for us is an assessment of what your values are. Are you going to lift as you climb? And we have found you know, that, is, that is something that we pay close attention to. And we've had conversations with candidates about why their campaigns look the way they look. And if they have a clear understanding uh, or a clear answer as to why they have decided not to or, oh, we can't find any resumes, we have people for you. We will, we will send them uh, because it is, it is critically important because, and what it also says, it is not just, oh, we need black constituent affairs people or we need a black field, we need somebody to run um, our field division that is that is black it is also making a statement that black staff can do every single role in a campaign not to be pigeonholed into one particular place and it all it changes the narrative it changes what people see it changes how people think if your your um, general counsel is a black woman and she's coming to all of these uh, hearings and markups and, and is engaged in the work, it changes what people, how people perceive what we can do. And there is so much, and then it also is that, it's that little girl as well, for her to see that she can be a general counsel to a member of Congress or a US Senator because there has been this commitment to make sure that there is the most qualified person and digging deep to make sure that that person who was probably not you know, being you know, picked up as, as the son of or so-and-so's husband or whatever uh, and really finding the, tr the best staff to, make, to um, elevate those voices so that the people who come into the office, they see that and they understand what that means. So it is critically important to us uh, that our candidates have offices that reflect the district and also offices that reflect America. And I forgot what your second question is, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, great. There was, there was a three. Um, hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Osendi Garcia. Uh, I'm a community organizer from East Harlem. Um, I've been doing research on uh, the rental assistance developmental program that's being rolled out throughout the nation. Um, this program has the potential to alleviate the $500 billion deficit that the New York City Housing Authority currently has. Mm -hmm. um, but it has a lot more potential to um, displace a large majority of um, the people that are in my community and will probably affect your community as well, as it's a national program. Um, I've shared uh, a lot of the information I, I've, I've found. I've uh, you know, spoken to individuals who are actually writing the policy around this. Um, and actually being in the room with individuals that are, have spent over 20 years actually doing the work, making sure that they're advocating for their tenants. Um, but I find them to be uh, disheartened. Mm -hmm. And um, it, this is going to be a very big fight. Mm -hmm. um, and as a community organizer, I would like to be able to provide some support uh, other than just the facts um, and research. Um, what would you suggest? Um, I would um, <coughs> suggest that you reach out and find as many allies uh, as possible. I know and I live in New York and um, have been reading about this uh, for a while and there are, I, I think it's one of those issues, that, and I think this goes for so much of organizing, it is the message as well as the messenger. So the, the people that you're working with, the, the tenants who are fighting for their, for their housing, um, 
They need, it, they have the facts and the figures that you've provided them. They have their own personal stories, but it is having someone who can connect to the people who are making the decisions in a way that they are not. So find, figuring out who is that ambassador, who is that validator, who can step in and say, basically, and I hate that it has to be this, but basically say what they just said. Say the same things that you've said, but maybe they are of a different complexion, maybe they are of a di different gender, maybe they are of a different uh, socioeconomic class, but because of that difference, they will actually be heard. The issues will actually be heard. Uh, but also knowing that it, that person is only as strong as the coalition standing behind them. So for them to stand and say, I'm speaking on behalf of X number of thousands of New Yorkers and, and people across the country who live in public housing, this is what I, my message is, hopefully we'll, we'll tip the needle. <laughs> is so powerful because it's never about us it's not an ego driven you just explained how she could get to, to Z by going one two three B C D right most people aren't willing to do that most leaders aren't willing to do that because I must be the one that says X Y and Z but real leadership is able to do what you explained and most black women <coughs> leaders typically it's not about us we're trying to figure out how to get to the goal so I think that's an important part of what you've been saying, but th that example was just a great example. Jean? <laughs> no, I just was um, thinking about when you talked about some of the roadblocks and the challenges that the parties put up for some of these women. And you know, I'm sitting here because Assemblywoman Berlina Reynolds Jackson is sitting here, and she's also one of the few women, and even fewer women of color, that have served as a county party chair in this state. And I imagine that to be true around the country. Mm -hmm. So I just, you know, it's not a real question, but just sort of your reflections on what it's going to take to get women of color and black women as party gatekeepers in a bigger way. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, <laughs> So in uh, 2017, um, Higher Heights, along with 30 other uh, activists, uh, black women activists around, unelected officials around the country, um, called the question to the DNC. Where, where and when were we going to get our return on our investment? And we wrote an open letter. And you know, because we know and love Joanne Reed, she put it on her show. And Tom Perez had to answer. And the question was, black women are the base of the Democratic Party. We know what we did in 2016. We know what we did in 2017. We know what we did in 2018. But you're not investing in us. Imagine what things would be like if you invested in us. And we had a lot of conversations. Where we had a meeting where all of the signers came together and the DNC had to respond. And it was, um, frankly, a little disappointing uh, because the, the chairman said, well, you know, he basically brought every black woman in the building to the meeting and said, this is, this is my staff. This is, this is my commitment. Um, and some of the women were in great leadership positions, and some of them were vice president, president of paper clips. Um, but he said, basically said, you know, we try and lead by example, but we can't make them do it. And that was um, extremely unsatisfying for everybody in the room. And um, so we have started. Uh, many of the signers have had conversations with state party chairs about, you know, how how are you, how is the system set up that perpetuates the same leadership? What can we do to, to disrupt this process so that it opens the doors? Uh, some parties have been very open to that. Some have not. Some have said, I don't even I don't see why this is a problem. Um, but it is a continuous uh, conversation uh, that, you know, until 
we are able to, you know, really have a frank, um, open and um, productive conversation about race and gender and intersectionality in this country, we will never really acknowledge that how there has been systemic disenfranchisement, you know, going back to 1619, if not before. Uh, and we are still um, dealing with the repercussions of that, the systems that were set up not just to keep us out, but to actually cut us off. And so I want to say thank you to Kimberly. Uh, we're kind of running low on time, so we could do maybe one more question. <laughs> um, hello, I'm Paola Almonte. I'm a student at Rutgers University um, and also a work study here at COP. Um, my question is, how would you like to see Higher Heights grow in the future? Ooh, um, I would love to see, um, I'll take a, a slightly modified version of, of that question. Um, someone asked me this um, recently of like, when do you know that your work is done? And um, I think, <laughs> um, I don't know if, if our work will ever be done. I think when we get to the point uh, where black women are no longer waiting, that we are unabashedly kicking down doors uh, and demanding our seats at the table, and that the response back is not to recoil or to penalize or to um, marginalize and um, threaten women who do that and that the narrative around the importance of diverse voices, not just in elected office, but all across the board, when that is part of the national discourse on a daily basis to the point where it's being talked about on Fox News, um, then I will say we have, we have you know, staked, a, we've had a concrete impact on America. I think you know, there, there are things that you could say that we've done so far, but I think the biggest uh, hurdle is the, the, the national discourse, the conversation, and the way black women's leadership is viewed in this country. And when that begins to shift, where people are saying, why not, more than, oh, and looking kind of blankly like it's something that had never crossed their minds before, when they're demanding why not, um, that's, that's when we will have, have arrived. Um, Debbie Walsh, the director of the Center for American Women and Politics, and I just want to thank you, Kimberly. I want to thank you for all your work with Higher Heights. I want to thank you for coming to the Center for American Women and Politics many years ago and saying, how can we work together? It has been a privilege for us to partner with Higher Heights over the years and to watch your idea grow from, as you describe it, uh, a napkin or a placemat um, into what it has become, the force that it has become. And we so appreciate your being here tonight and sharing the story of Higher Heights and the work that you've been doing and your commitment. So thank you so much. Thank you.